morning to all the crash course, you made the crash course participants. I have the pleasure today to welcome uh, at the Department of Political and Social Sciences of the University of Catania, Professor Frederick Golpi. He is very well known. I'm sure that our students uh, really know perfectly his uh, extensive uh, uh, literature. He is uh, currently based um, at the University of uh, St. Andrews uh, and uh, he has um, devoted most of his research to the issues of uh, uh, authoritarian resiliency, authoritarian regimes, how to change, is that change possible, and most recently several of his publications are focusing on uh, Islamism. The title of today's uh, lecture and as you know, the lecture will be divided into two different parts, then first lecture, then break, and uh, the second lecture. The title of uh, today's lecture is Constructing Revolutions and Authoritarianism on the Southern Shores of the Mediterranean, which is one of the topics which has been dealt the most during our Mediterranean politics course this year. Well, the first semester is probably uh, gone already, but I really en encourage my students, my global students, to intervene and interact in order to test some ideas or hypotheses which were uh, coming into your brain while working on the Mediterranean politics uh, papers. Uh, do not feel shy. Please intervene. The aim of this crash course is uh, to train, not just to share and provide education, but to train our uh, participants so that uh, uh, interaction with lecturers is uh, continuous. As you know, at 2 we will finish at 12.30 and at 2 we have the research session. We have three excellent PhD projects which are going to be presented in the afternoon and then we will conclude as usual with the training session at uh, 4.30. Now, thank you very much for accepting my invitation, uh, Frederic. Uh, we already mentioned yesterday that um, you are one of the editors of Mediterranean Politics, which is the, the mass, let's say, the main uh, journal our students have to read, at least I'm talking Good. about my students, and then it's a sort of compulsory <coughs> reading. Please, you have to go. Thank you very much, Stefania, and thank you for inviting me in lovely Catania uh, in, in uh, July. Um, today, I'll, I'll be talking mainly about uh, political crisis. Uh, I know you are all dealing with different kind of crises in the Mediterranean region, um, and I want to focus on not only uh, the practical aspects of political crisis, uh, the, the, the results, the outcomes of the Arab uprisings, if you wish, uh, but also about the concept of crisis. How, how do we understand uh, a crisis? How, how do we conceptualize a crisis? Um, how do we see it coming? Can we see coming a uh, uh, new crisis? and um, what kind of policy responses are appropriate to periods of crisis. Um, and so behind the, the, the practical illustration that I will be giving you in relation to uh, the Arab uprisings, as it is here shown on the, uh, um, on the PowerPoint, um, I want you to think uh, uh, about the conceptual implications. What... Um, what is the Arab Spring, I prefer the Arab uprisings really, what are the Arab uprisings telling us about the nature of crisis in the region? So what is the past telling us about the future? Um, and, um, and as you can see from the, uh, from the first slide on, on PowerPoint, of course, the Arab uprisings, as we know, are not all finished. Uh, indeed, we are dealing today uh, with uh, the consequences of the Syrian conflict uh, on uh, various fronts. And, uh, and it may well be that some of the, of the crises that we sought at finish, like in Libya, are starting again. Um, so the, 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 the Arab uprisings are, are still not entirely uh, finished as we speak. And 
the way I, I'm going to structure my presentation today is um, in the first lecture, which is going to be a bit less than an hour now since we started late, um, I will concentrate on the starting point of crisis. How do political crises start? And, um, and in the second lecture, um, I will be concentrating on the exit uh, uh, of crisis. How do political crises end or don't end uh, as, it, as it may? So, um, so to begin with, uh, the, 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 the beginning of political crisis in the region um, and, and to understand the, the background of the Arab uprisings, of course, you have to think about the policy and scholarly context before 2011. Before 2011, before the Arab uprisings, policymakers like scholars uh, really thought that the Middle East, from the entire of North Africa and the Middle East, from Morocco to, to Turkey, that the region was very, very stable. We had stable authoritarian regimes which were there to stay. Uh, and, and we had this kind of scholarly narrative and this policy narrative about the region that made authoritarianism appear quite natural. Uh, we really did not question that much authoritarianism in the sense that when we question it, authoritarian regimes seem to have a very effective answer uh, to these questions. Whether challenges were internal domestic challenges or whether there were external pressures uh, from foreign governments. Um, and so before 2011, we were in this situation where no one was really seeing an exit to authoritarian regimes in the region. And therefore, in policy term, of course, uh, foreign policy, uh, be it at the level of the European Union or at the level of bilateral relations between European countries and North African and Middle Eastern countries, um, these, these policies were articulated on the notion that these authoritarian regimes were here to stay and therefore these policies were at best pushing for reform but not pushing too hard in order not to antagonize uh, the authoritarian regimes of the region which were meant to be stable and theirs to stay. And here you have a quote by Asef Bayat who produced a very interesting book called Life as Politics in 2010 just before the, the Arab uprisings, uh, saying that you know, most people had given up on the idea that uh, the Middle East and North Africa were, uh, was able to change. Um, and uh, Asef Bayat was looking mainly at social movement and social mobilization. How was social mobilization able to change politics in the region? Uh, and in 2010, Bayat uh, suggested that uh, the best way to consider social mobilization in the Arab world uh, was to look at micro-politics, was to look at non-movements, which is to say at social changes happening below the level of politics uh, that did not attract the attention of governments. Uh, and these kind of micro-social and micro-political changes were the only way to obtain change in the region. The, the events of 2011 somehow show that he wasn't entirely right. Uh, but, but in many ways, this, this was the way in which uh, uh, most uh, scholars and most policymakers were thinking about the region at the time. And what we have, of course, in 2011 is a sudden transformation of politics in the region. I'm not sure if you can recognize the uh, portrait uh, uh, on the slide here. 
um, this guy used to be very famous for a while, less famous nowadays, uh, is Mohamed Bouazizi, the person that set himself on fire in Tunisia in uh, December 2010. Uh, and this is the event that kick-started uh, the Tunisian revolution, which in turn kick-started a, a wave of uprisings um, across uh, the region. And, and the death of uh, Mohamed Bouazizi at the end of 2010 came to be seen as the transformative event uh, in the region that started uh, the, the Arab uprisings. Now, you have to be very careful uh, with this notion of particular crises being started by particular events. Uh, these are the uh, uh, Sidi Bouzi uh, riots. Uh, this is the town in which uh, Mohamed Bouazizi lived. Uh, and these were, in Tunisia, the first riots in December 2010 that snowballed eventually to topple the, the Tunisian regimes uh, in the middle of, of January 2011. Uh, but again, you have to be very careful about seeing particular political crisis being the direct outcome of specific events. Um, and um, here you have uh, scholars of, of revolutions like William Sewell, uh, which draw our attention to the fact that transformative events, such as somebody setting himself on fire, a sudden wave of rioting somewhere in Tunisia. These transformative events are not usually immediately seen as transformative events. And this is an important element. We don't know that a crisis is starting when a crisis is starting. It is only retrospectively that we make sense of these, of the, of these events as being the beginning of a crisis. But at the time, we don't know that. And this is important in terms of the policy response of governments. Governments don't respond to the beginning of a crisis because they don't know that this is the beginning of a crisis. So when Bouazizi set himself on fire in mid-December uh, 2010, this was just a guy setting himself on fire. And he was not the only one. In Tunisia, there had been a couple of people that had set himself, themselves on fire you know, that same year, and nothing had happened. Um, uh, a few weeks later in Algeria, dozens of people would set themselves on fire, and nothing would happen. Um, so specific events that are seen retrospectively as transformative events, as the, the starting point of crisis, these are connections we make retrospectively to try to give a meaning about particular crises. When do they start? And we choose particular events as being indicative of the starting point of a crisis. But you have to be careful that these kind of events happen all the time, and they do not necessarily create a crisis. They can, but not necessarily. The same with these kind of riots. There were local riots in Tunisia, there were local riots in Algeria, in Libya, every right now and then. Not all of them necessarily create massive political crises that led to the fall of regimes. So at the beginning of crisis, what you see, what the Tunisian government saw at the time, were just a bunch of people in the street, burning cars, wreaking havoc. Not the beginning of a massive political crisis. Um, so, these transformative events are, are, you have to be careful with the kind of the narrative, the way you read about particular crises retrospectively, because some events are given particular significance that they do not necessarily have at the time. And the way in which these events came about do not necessarily tell you very much about the mechanisms of the crisis subsequently. The, the first wave of riots in Tunisia do not really tell you why the Tunisian regime was about to fall. 
this first wave of protests, they do not really tell you what was fundamentally wrong with the Tunisian regime. Even though retrospectively we may try to connect some fundamental flaws of the regime that are illustrated in these riots, initially it's not entirely clear that this first wave of riots really tell you much about why a particular political system is doomed to failure or not. And, and of course, at the beginning of any significant political crisis, I take again the example of, of Tunisia, I, I really like this um, uh, picture of, of the, um, this advert for Ben Ali trying to calm the, 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 the rioters in, in Tunis. At, at the beginning of a crisis, um, not only do governments not know that what is happening is a major crisis, and therefore their response may not be you know, as, as adapted as they should, but also the people starting the crisis themselves don't know that they are st starting a massive political crisis. At the beginning of any kind of crisis, any kind of political uh, uh, unrest, people don't want regime change. People want the regime to change, and there is a significant difference here. They don't want a revolution. They don't want the fall of Ben Ali, of Mubarak, of Gaddafi, choose the leader that you want. They want the regime to change its policies, to respond to their need, to provide more socioeconomic benefits, to provide uh, uh, more political rights, to, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So at the beginning of these kind of political events, at the beginning of the Arab uprisings, uh, you do not have a revolutionary discourse. You do not have very strong political demands about regime change. These will only come later on during the process of mobilization. At the beginning of this political crisis, people are still engaging with the authority, with the power that be and asking them to reform themselves. And it is, of course, during the process of mobilization that these demons progressively change, become more radical in inverted comma. So from regime, demanding the regime to change, suddenly people will start to ask for the fall of the regime. And this can happen at, at different pace. So in the case of Tunisia, it took quite a few weeks for actually people to start demanding the departure of Ben Ali, for, to demand the, the fall of the regime from mid-December 2010 to mid-January 2010, about a month. In other cases, it, it was much quicker. Um, in the case of Egypt, it was slightly quicker. In the case of Libya, it was much, much quicker. Uh, in the case of Syria, it took more time. And, uh, and these are kind of protest dynamics uh, that are set in motion and that are very specific to the country in question. So you do not have a, a, a general guidelines about when are protests going to change from being about reforming the system to being about toppling the system. Uh, this is a natural progression. Uh, you should be looking for that. Um, but the pace at which it happens uh, uh, changes with the location, with the country, with the response of the government, of course. Um, and there is no natural progression. Uh, demands for reforms may stay at the level of reform without uh, going all the way to uh, demanding the fall of the regime. Um, and here are a few uh, observations by well-known scholars of these uh, um, protest movements and political transformation. Uh, the first one by Macadam Taro and Tilly, which uh, you probably know of, um, who indicate that um, you have to see really social movement mobilization and revolutions along the same spectrum. 
So revolutions are not really that different from small social mobilization asking for reform. It is all part of the same spectrum. Uh, just revolution being at the kind of the, the, the one end of this continuum of social mobilization, where social mobilization is so intense and massive that the institutions of the state can no longer survive uh, in the same way as before. And social mobilization induces a, a massive transformation of the state structure. Um, the second observation by O'Donnell and, and Schmitter is a fairly old observation, but still valid. Uh, this was something that they highlighted in the mid 80s when they were looking at democratization processes in Latin America. And this is something that we saw in the late 90s in Eastern Europe at the time of the fall of the communist bloc, at the, fall of the, the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. And this is something we saw again in 2011 in the context of the Arab uprisings. Um, and this is to highlight the importance of agency during times of crisis. Um, and they highlight that during this time of crisis, uh, the political direction of this protest, the political direction of events, um, is very much dependent upon the choices of the actors involved in these events. Uh, it is also dependent very much upon chance. It is also dependent upon un unintended consequences. Uh, it is also dependent upon the reconstruction of political identities during this time of crisis. All of this to say that at the beginning of a political crisis, you do not really know where this is going. Mainly because, well, the participants themselves may not know where they are going because they are in the process of reconstructing their political identity. Because suddenly they have an opportunity to voice their political choices, which they did not have before, which means that they have to think about what their political choices actually are in a way that they were not necessarily thinking before, except in very theoretical terms, because there were no opportunity for them to express their political views. So periods of crisis are really uh, sequences during which people make up their mind about the political system that they want. And of course, because a lot of people are making up their mind at the same time and at the time where they are also mobilizing, people don't necessarily get what they want. There are a lot of unintended consequences of actions that produce particular outcome. Um, and, uh, and these outcomes are not necessarily the one that people wanted on the ground. And, um, and a, a final quote by uh, Gamson and Mayer to, to emphasize um, that it is quite difficult to think about political crisis in structural terms in the sense that a lot of these political dynamics are dependent upon interpretations that people make at the time. It cannot be that there is a political opportunity that people do not see. If people don't see an oppor a political opportunity, then there is no opportunity to speak of. You cannot, see, you cannot only talk about the political opportunity that people have seized, they have acted upon. Um, otherwise, um, you know, the, the, the structure of the system does not really tell you what is likely to happen. It all depends on interpretation that people make at the time and the choices and the action uh, that people um, uh, take. Um, so, in the context of the Arab uprisings, um, once this wave of rioting starts in Tunisia at the beginning of 2011, uh, that is so powerful that it leads Ben Ali to leave 
the country in fear for his life, then this changes uh, the type of behavior that people on the ground will start displaying, not only in Tunisia, but also in other countries of the region uh, where people suddenly become very inspired by what is happening in Tunisia. So after Tunisia, we have uh, uh, mobilization and riots in Egypt, in Algeria, in Libya, Morocco, Syria, and so on and, and so forth. Um, these transformative events, uh, such as the one uh, seen in Tunisia, lead to different interpretation of political opportunities in the region. And these different interpretation of political opportunities in the region lead people to behave differently in a way that they would not have done before, or not on the same scale. Of course, some activists would always have protested, uh, but, but size is important in that particular context. Um, and this also, of course, induces changes in perception uh, amongst uh, governments, not only domestically, but internationally. Uh, and the, the Libyan case is particularly illuminating in that context because just before the Arab uprisings um, in the late 2000, uh, the Libyan regime had been very good at mending relations with European countries in order to get political support, financial support, even some military uh, support from uh, European governments. Uh, Colonel Gaddafi had become one of the best friends of Europe, uh, not least because it was, it was promising to uh, uh, manage migration coming from uh, Africa. Uh, and this was particularly important from some Southern European countries. Uh, and, and we had a situation where uh, the perception of foreign governments and the behavior of foreign governments uh, suddenly began to change in the face of mobilization on the ground in uh, the country of the Arab uprisings. And and the role of force is particularly important in this context. And, and here you have to be very careful because it is the main narrative is usually that the role of the security forces is crucial for authoritarian regimes in the region and that security forces main role is to repress dissent. Uh, and by and large, this is a quite accurate observation. The main job of the security forces in the region is not to wage war against other countries or to protect the country against foreign invasion. The main task of the security forces in the authoritarian regimes of the region is to repress the population in case the population does not agree with the regime. And we are, we are seeing this quite well in the case of Syria today. Um, at the same time, um, security forces can have a, a counterproductive role, and particularly when there is an ill-applied use of force by the state. And an ill-applied use of force by the state means that instead of repressing dissent, uh, security forces will generate more dissent than they repress. And this is by and large what we have seen in most of the country of the Arab uprising at one, one point or another. This is what happened in Tunisia. This is what happened briefly in Egypt. This is what happened uh, quite visibly in Libya. This is what happened in Syria, in Yemen, and so on and so forth. Um, for the role of the security forces to be counterproductive, you need to have at least two conditions uh, uh, present at the same time. Uh, and this is quite a common observation of, of you know, social mobilization and, and social movement theory. Uh, first, you have to have an audience that perceives this repression to be illegitimate or unjust. Uh, so there is a normative element here. Uh, this repression by the state has to be perceived as illegitimate, unjust. And secondly, information 
about this unjust repression, this illegitimate repression, has to be communicated to a large enough audience uh, that is able to put pressure on the authorities uh, using this repression. So this uh, uh, information about illegitimate violence has to be communicated widely. And this is where this element of internet revolution, media revolution, uh, comes into play in the context of, of the Arab uprising. Uh, the, the role of the new media was particularly important in terms of diffusing this perception of violence by the state, illegitimate violence used by the state to large audiences which were receptive to this message. Uh, diffusion to large audiences domestically so that people could mobilize again in larger number and internationally. And this is a point uh, about uh, the uh, changing international perceptions about particular regimes, such as the regime of Colonel Gaddafi, once rioting started in Libya and once uh, violence started in a fairly significant way in Libya. Um, and in the case of Libya, we have, I guess, this is the, the, the most significant and rapid transformation of international perception and therefore policy change toward particular regimes in the region. We have this rapid change uh, between Colonel Gaddafi being the new best friend of Western governments to Colonel Gaddafi going back to being uh, 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 a paria uh, in the international community and international actors um, from neighboring European countries to uh, the United States very quickly um, shifting their position and changing their foreign policy towards uh, Libya. The date is important here. This is uh, the, uh, uh, the time of the uh, signing of the Security Council Resolution 1973, authorizing um, the uh, uh, international intervention in Libya to protect civilian populations, allegedly, uh, which was signed in mid-March uh, 2011 whereas the first riots in Libya started in mid-February 2011. So in terms of uh, United Nations Security Council resolution, a month is, is blistering fast. It hardly ever happens that way. Uh, and, and this is a, a good illustration of kind of reinterpretation of a particular situation and policy change uh, in the aftermath of this uh, reinterpretation from supporting particular regime to opposing particular regimes. Uh, and, um, and in the case of the, uh, the Libyan revolution, international actors came to be seen as ma major actors in the revolution themselves. Uh, whereas in other parts of the Arab uprisings, we were dealing mainly with domestic revolutions, um, domestic uprisings. Uh, the Libyan case was clearly involving international actors as much as uh, domestic actors. And at some point, which of course is not no longer the case today, uh, as you can see on the, uh, uh, the graffiti on the picture, uh, NATO, the USA, France, the UK, as England here, uh, were particularly fashionable in Libya. They are no longer anymore. Uh, but, but for a while, they were quite uh, fashionable because of this change of policy. Um, and what we have had in, in the Libyan context is um, is a case of miscalculation, really. And this is going back to what I was uh, uh, talking about earlier in, te in, in, in terms of, in times of crisis, people are reconstructing their political identity and, rec and reconstructing their political choices. 
This applies not only to people on the ground protesting, but this also applies to governments and to foreign governments. Uh, during times of crisis, they are reevaluating their policy options. And because this is a crisis, because events uh, are changing very quickly on the ground, foreign governments, like protesters on the street, also get it wrong sometimes. And in the case of the Libyan revolution, in the case of the Libyan uprising, they got it wrong to some important degree in the sense that at the end of February 2011, when major international players like the French and the British, the American follow on later, starting to position themselves in favor of the Libyan insurgents, in favor of the rebels, this was because the rebels in Libya were making steady progress and because the regime of Gaddafi looks to be on the brink of collapse. And this, why, and this is why on the back of the Tunisian revolution, where everyone was taken by surprise, on the back of the Egyptian revolution, where foreign policymakers were surprised, but not so much, when it came the time of the Libyan revolution, foreign policymakers were quite expecting the regime to fall by itself. And therefore, they positioned themselves in favor of the rebels before the actual fall of the Libyan regime. They kind of pre-position themselves in favor of those actors who they see as the likely winners of the Libyan revolution. However, things on the ground did not happen as expecting. And at the beginning of March 2013, Gaddafi made a comeback with better organized uh, military uh, campaign, Gaddafi began to regain uh, some of the territory that was previously under the uh, 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 rebel control. Um, and by the time the United States, uh, the United Nations resolution uh, on Libya was voted, the rebels in Libya were very much on the back foot. Uh, but by that time, um, Western governments, most of the uh, important Western governments had decided to side in favor of uh, the rebels in Libya. Uh, and what this meant was that they decided then to put their military weight behind the rebels in a way that they did not necessarily want in the first instance. Uh, initially, obviously, the uh, uh, no-fly zone was not really intended to support the rebels in Libya, uh, but mainly to be there as a, a political, uh, as a show of political support for the insurgents, not as a real military intervention. And this initial token support for the insurgent in Libya turned into actual military intervention because once these governments had positioned themselves in favor of the rebels, they had to ensure that the rebels were actually winning against the Gaddafi regime because it would have been very costly politically to backtrack. Um, and, and I guess you can see some of this tension in the case of the Libyan uh, in the case of the Syrian civil conflict today, where many Western governments pre-position themselves in favor of the Syrian rebels. And then once they realized that the Syrian rebels were not able to topple the Assad regime, they did not really know what to do, whether to support more the rebels to ensure that they win or whether to withdraw. And they decided to sit on the fence, most famously with Barack Obama, uh, you know, read uh, a line about the use of chemical weapons uh, and the United States not deciding to do anything afterwards. So they, had to, to, they, they decided to sit on the fence, which was not uh, a particularly politically successful solution. In the case of Libya, they decided to go all the way. And once they had started to support the rebel politically, 
they decided to support them militarily to ensure that they were winning and therefore uh, that the story ended as they had uh, estimated it, it would end. The situation, of course, could have turned very differently in the sense that a no-fly zone is, of course, not a guarantee of military support. It could have gone otherwise. Um, the cartoon about uh, Qaddafi crawling uh, here um, is um, reminiscent uh, of the first Gulf War, if you can stretch your memory that far back. The first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, uh, there was an international coalition that uh, um, um, intervened in Kuwait to kick uh, Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And then uh, at the time in 1991, there were major uprisings in Iraq, in the Shia and in the Kurds area. Uh, and the international coalition decided to support these uprisings in Iraq by imposing a no-fly zone as well. But in that case, it was a strict no-fly zone, which meant that Saddam Hussein was not able to fly his plane, but Saddam Hussein was able to repress the uprisings using uh, its uh, tanks and other uh, military uh, equipment. So the no-fly zone in Iraq in 1991 did not mean a campaign of bombing in favor of the, of the rebels, in favor of the uprising. So in Libya, it could have gone that way. Qaddafi could easily have reconquered uh, uh, the ground that he had lost to the rebels if um, foreign powers had decided to apply the no-fly zone strictly. In that case, they decided to put their military weight behind the rebels in order to ensure the outcomes to the Libyan uprising that they wanted. Now, on the ground, of course, uh, these outcomes to particular uprisings uh, are also very dependent upon the role played by institutionalized actors. I have been talking so far about the uprising themselves, about social mobilization, about people protesting, mobilizing, uh, voicing their political choices, uh, reconstructing their political identities. Um, and that is, of course, something that is extremely important in all the uprisings that we have seen across the region since 2011. Uh, but of course, these uprisings do not simply involve protesters. They, they, they do not simply involve leaderless mobilization, leaderless movements. They also involve, quite importantly, institutionalized uh, social and political actors, such as in the case of uh, Tunisia, uh, the, uh, uh, the unions, um, such as political parties, um, in, country, in other countries of the region, like Morocco, such as movements, Islamist movement, like the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt. Um, these are institutionalized uh, social and political actors that can mobilize in favor of the protesters on the street, or who can support reforms in government. And the role played by different institutionalized actors is quite important for producing particular trajectories of crisis, depending on how these actors position themselves. So social movements like the Islamist, uh, um, political parties, um, civil society movements like unions, they all have had an important role to play in this different uprising, and they all play a slightly different role. So in the case of, of Tunisia, institutionalized actors like the unions, uh, which were the main organized political force in the country, only came in late uh, during the day. They only came uh, at the beginning 
of uh, January 2011, after about two and a half weeks of, of street protest, and they came out mainly in favor of the street protesters. Uh, but the unions in Tunisia were never directing the protests. They were rather following events on the ground. A bit like you know, foreign governments uh, positioning themselves uh, depending on uh, the way in which the wind was turning on the ground. Uh, the union in, in Tunisia ended up playing an important role in Tunisia at the time of the departure of Ben Ali. Uh, but really, they were responding to events on the ground. In Tunisia, it was because there were a lot of people mobilizing against the regime that the unions decided to call for a general strike. And this happened on the 11th of January 2011, which is about three days before the departure of Ben Ali from Tunisia. So three days before the fall of the regime, which is quite late in the day to mobilize for, for the unions. So they came out in support of the protester when it appears that the protester had the upper end. They did not come out of the woods before. Uh, so they, play, they ended up playing an important role, but the general strike that they call was uh, really coming at the back of a very strong wave of, of street protests. Um, and of course, these institutionalized actors also include um, part of the elite. When we are talking about political crisis, of course, all of those of you who have studied democratization processes, uh, you have always a, a reformist part of the elite or part of the elite, uh, uh, part of the old regime that is willing to work with the protesters. Uh, and, and, these, uh, and these elites, this is uh, Mohamed Ganucci, uh, 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 the prime minister of Tunisia for a little while uh, after the revolution, prime minister under Ben Ali as well. The willingness of part of the old regime to work with the protester is quite important in shaping a particular exit to the crisis. So in the case of Tunisia, of course, part of the uh, 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 elite, part of the old regime, was quite willing to work with the protesters. And this part of the old regime also included, of course, in an important way, uh, the military. Uh, this is a picture of uh, General Amar, the chief of staff in Tunisia. Um, so security forces, which you usually associate with the regime, can, of course, change their mind and work with the opposition if they find it more in their interest. Uh, we have seen that in, in uh, um, Tunisia uh, in the Arab uprisings. We have seen that in the case of Egypt as well, although, of course, in the case of Egypt, the military changed their mind several times uh, over the years. Um, we have seen that to some degree in Libya as well, in the sense that in the Libyan case, the military uh, fragmented into different factions, some supporting the regime, other opposing the regime. Um, and we have seen the opposite happening in the case of Syria, of course, where the military by and large mostly supported the, uh, the Syrian regimes and helped it to, to survive. So the role of um, institutionalized actors from within the old elite and the way they position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the opposition, vis-a-vis -vis the protester, is quite important in shaping the exit uh, of the, the crisis. And of course, um, it is also quite important for the protesters themselves, and I will end uh, relatively soon with this, this first section, it is important for the protesters themselves to start managing the actual crisis that they themselves generated. Most of the crisis in the Arab uprising started as bottom-up uh, protests, leaderless movements. 
uh, and all of them, of course, at the end of the day, had to put an end to the mobilization that they created. They had to put an end to the violence, to the havoc, to the deinstitutionalization that they created. And they had to set up new political structures to manage the situation. Uh, most of the time, they do so by building up alliances with pre-existing actors. And we have seen that most clearly in the case of the Tunisian Revolution, where protesters negotiated with members of the old elite. We have seen that in the case of Egypt as well, with the Muslim Brotherhood negotiating with the government and with the military. So most of the time, you have this kind of alliances between opposition actors, protesters, and old elite members to find a negotiated agreement to the crisis. In some cases, when you don't have this kind of pre-agreements, uh, uh, opposition actors themselves have to set up new political structures to manage the crisis that they have created. And we've seen that most clearly, and also with the most flows, uh, in the case of Libya. Uh, in the case of Libya, uh, even at the time of the, uh, the conflict between the rebels and the Qadhafi regime, uh, the rebels issued a, a provisional constitutional declaration in the summer of 2011 outlining uh, the shape of the political system in a post qaddafi Libya. As we all know, it did not work exactly as they planned. Um, but you can see already uh, in the middle of the crisis, this effort by opposition actors, by, by those actors who, who started as kind of leaderless protest protests to generate some kind of political structure to impose order on a particular crisis to be able to manage the situation and to find an exit to, uh, to the crisis. Uh, and I will end this um, first um, half of the presentation uh, by stressing that um, there is clearly a structural component in all these uprisings, in all these political crises. And this structural component comes from the, um, the organization of the opposition forces in each of these countries before the crisis. So in some cases, opposition forces are already quite well organized. So we have seen that in the case of Tunisia with the Union in the case of Morocco with a political party, in the case of Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. In other cases, uh, opposition actors are not really organized before a crisis. And this was clearly the case in Libya, uh, where there was no clearly organized opposition forces. And so the way in which institutionalized actors, the way in which organized political forces can shape and exit to the crisis pretty much depends on their you know, prior organization. And the second point, of course, is that there is always a choice for these opposition forces, for these institutionalized actors, between throwing their weight behind the protesters or negotiating with the regime. And they always walk a fine line when there is a, a period of, of uh, a, a intense protest, where there is a period of crisis, they can either throw their weight with the protesters and try to bring down the regime completely and start to recreate a new political system afterwards. Or they can choose not to throw their weight behind the protesters, behind the street protests, but instead, more instrumentally, use the unrest to try to extract concession from the regime, to try to negotiate with the regime to get a better deal. And this will be the kind of reformist exit to a crisis rather than regime change. 
Um, and this is, will, will be the, the kind of issue that I will be talking about in the second half of the, uh, of the presentation when I talk about exit to, to crisis, the role of institutionalized actors in negotiating uh, with authoritarian regimes to get concessions and in a way to strengthen the authoritarian system in place uh, instead of, of toppling it. <laughs> 